Sunday morning and we're in a study on the 70 weeks of Daniel. It takes a long time to teach this because it takes us from one end of the Bible to the other. It is everything that prophecy is about. And everything in the Bible, which is about God's family, which is Israel, Old Testament's literal Israel, New Testament's spiritual Israel. This is about a covenant that God made with Israel or with Israel's ancestors, particularly Abraham. I don't believe the covenant goes back just to Abraham. There was a covenant given to Noah, and that goes on back to Adam. When you go back to the first verse of Genesis, in the beginning God created created the heavens and the earth. Create is the word bara. Bara. And it means to cut and make fat. Now fat to us, we call that, that's something we think is bad. It's what we try to lose. It's this cellulite that's on the side of our bodies. Uh, it's our double chins. It's our uh, extra weight. Fat to the Jew was the richest. When you had the fat of the land, everybody hears about the fat of the land. The fat of the land meant the best crops, the best grapes, the best figs, the best fruit, uh, the best cattle. That's the fat. So cut and make fat. Cut is a very significant word there because bara is a righteous word. And bara comes from the word berith, B-E-R-I-Y-T-H, berith. And berith is the word covenant. And the Bible says that when God created everything in the beginning in Isaiah 45, 18, 45, 18, he said, I didn't create anything in vain. I created everything to be inhabited. So in the very first verse of Genesis, one one then you have righteousness in the word covenant i believe covenant goes all the way back to the first verse of genesis and then in the second verse you've got and the earth became without form without form and void and void and darkness this is the very nature of satan we see Sa satan's nature in the earth right here when you go to Revelation 12, you see Satan being cast into the earth by Michael, the archangel, and a third of the angels of heaven. Well, if you this 12th chapter of Revelation, this is a panoramic view of all time. Well, if you want to find the character of Satan, you go back to the second verse of Genesis. Without form, tohu is the same word as in vain in Isaiah 45, 18. So God says, I did not create tohu in vain. So the creation was, was long before, it's be, it is before this darkness enters upon the earth and all of this fear in verse 2. Uh, and then it goes into six days of making and forming, but not six days of creation. The creation is back here. The reason I put this up is not to teach on Genesis 1, I love teaching on Genesis 1 because it is, it is a picture of the elect. Here we are, born in innocence. Satan enters into our hearts. When God says, light, let there be light, he's saying, let the light in. That's circumcision of our hearts. The point I was bringing out in Genesis 1.1 is the covenant goes all the way back then. Then you have Adam, and you have uh, Adam and, and uh, Seth and Enosh, and the covenant goes to this line right here. Enosh, Canaan, Mahalalel, and then uh, uh, Jared, and uh, Enoch, and then Methuselah, Lamech, and Noah. Well, we know he had a covenant with Noah, and then Noah's got a son, Arphaxin, and you're going down to Salah, uh, Releg, Reu, Peleg, Serog, and then down to uh, Nahor, uh, Abraham, Nahor, Terah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. That's the covenant bloodline right there. But it began here. So we're, we're talking about, when we're talking about the covenant of God, we're talking about a bloodline, and everything in the Bible has to do with that bloodline. It started, of course, in the beginning, Genesis 1-1. 
then God has, and then he took with Adam and takes it all the way down to Jacob. Jacob's name is changed to Israel. And then, of course, Israel goes after, then you have Israel in the, you have the flood with Noah. And then you come out of the flood. You got Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob is Israel. He's got 12 sons that become the nation. And then, then through Jacob's 11th son, Joseph, they are put into bondage in Egypt 400 years. They're brought out by Moses, Moses, after 400 years, and then they go into the wilderness. They get the law just before they go through the wilderness, and God tells Israel, if you go after these idol gods, this is everything the Bible is about. This is not one of the timelines of the Bible. This is everything in the Bible. And every person that you come along later on in this in this lineage, it, whether it's Daniel or whether it's Samson, every Bible story has to do with this bloodline, has to do with this covenant. All those Bible stories, whether it's Samson or whether it's David killing Goliath, all these are Jews. It's about their salvation. And then, of course, God tells uh, Israel, if you go after other gods, if you go after other gods, Moses, you tell them, I'm going to send four judgments, sword, famine, and pestilence. And they went after other gods for 300 years under judges, for 500 years under kings, from 1 Samuel to 2 Chronicles. Second Chronicles. And then God scatters Israel. He sends all these different prophets to them, prophesying to them, saying, God's going to bring this judgment on you. And then when he puts them into captivity, because they never kept their sabbatical years, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, every seven years, God says, I'll scatter you throughout the earth. And that's what he did. He scattered northern Israel in 722 B.C., southern Judah in 586 B.C., and they stay scattered all over the earth through all the different empires and the nations that rule them until God brings them back in the 20th century, particularly these dates, 1917, 1920, 1947, 19, excuse me, 48, 1948, well, 47 is significant too, 48, 1957, I'll get in a minute, 1957, 1967, 1973, and then all these other peace uh, movements, the Oslo Accords in the 90s, and all these, and, and the, uh, when you saw uh, Begin, huh? 1917. Well, I put 1917 there. Huh? Mary, let me do this, okay? All right. Now, all these are significant. There's the liberation of Israel, 1917. The Balfour Declaration, 1920. The expiration of the Balfour Declaration, May 14, 1948. The Sinai War, 1957. The Six Day War, 1967. The liberation of Jerusalem for the first time in 2,600 years. Whoops, that's what she's talking about. 1973. That's the Yom Kippur War or the Day of Atonement War. And then all these peace accords that they've tried to come up with since. And all of it because Israel kept going after all these gods. Baal, Grove, Shemash, Molech, and all of these gods have to do, when they're scattered all over the earth, they end up speaking all these different tongues, these different glossa, the different dialectos, and that has, and I'll go over that tonight. All of this, I'll go over tonight. All these tongues, when they come back together at Pentecost here, that's what this is about. And I'm not going into that right now. I'll cover that tonight. So all of this has to do with all these dates and all these wars in the Middle East. And all this has to do with the World Trade Center coming down uh, in 2001. And it, all of that has to do with what Israel did over here. Now we're talking about the 70 weeks of Daniel. Let's go back over there to Daniel 9. Daniel 9. I I started studying the 70 weeks in 1964. I was 25. I had heard about prophecy. I'd been trying to study prophecy. And I 
I was trying to get a hold of it. If you think you got a hold of it real quick by listening to me teach for a year or two, you really haven't. It took me a long, long time of studying, year after year, decade after decade, for these things to synthesize and come together. You're hearing something you won't hear anywhere else. You say, Jim, you sound arrogant. No, I know how people feel about the 70 weeks of Daniel and the preachers. It terrifies them for somebody to mention it and say, can you explain this to me? Walk up to any so-called scholarly man and ask him to explain the 70 weeks of Daniel. Watch him talk in a circle. They don't know anything about it. They think all those Old Testament stories are s separate Bible stories. They're not. They're all a part. This is one story from beginning of the Bible to the end. Now, let's look here in Daniel 9. Daniel is in Babylon. We've already talked about the things that the reason Daniel's there, Ezekiel is over in Babylon. Kind of remember this. When Israel is carried away captive, certain prophets are carried over into Babylon. And Daniel and Ezekiel are two of those prophets. They will even tell you they're in Babylon. Ezekiel says he was by the river Kibar uh, there in the first chapter of Ezekiel, which is over in the land of Haran, which is Babylon. Babylon, I've said, is nothing but Iraq. Right here, that there's Iraq. That was Babylon on the Euphrates and the Tigris River. The capital city of Assyria was right about where Baghdad is, and that was Nineveh. And then the capital city of Babylon was the city of Babylon, the Babylonian Empire there on the Euphrates River. Now, Israel was carried because of their idolatry all the way over here, somewhere in the neighborhood of 600 to 700, could be 750 miles, depending on where you were carried away in Israel, and they had to travel in the green part. You see that right there? That's called, you see the grain? If I drew this on a board, what would you call that? It's a crescent. It's a crescent. You have a crescent moon like that. It's called the Fertile Crescent. That's where everyone had to travel in order to come to Israel because all this was desert. They couldn't travel 800 miles across the desert. So all the armies would come up here and come from the north. It was said they came from the east because they did. But they came into Israel from the north from that, through that crescent. Now, Daniel is in Babylon. Here's Babylon over here. Here's Israel over here. Here's Israel on the Mediterranean Sea, and here's Babylon on these two rivers. So when, when Israel was carried away, they had, they had several deportations. When Israel was carried away, had one in 605 B.C., when southern Judah was carried away, and they had one in five. 97, could be 96, I mean, that's not exact dates, B.C., and then had the final deportation, which was a military slaughter, and that was 586 B.C. Well, Daniel was carried away over here to Babylon. Daniel is in Babylon. And Ezekiel was carried away. It's believed they were carried away in uh, in this second deportation right there. That was a non-military. That was a peaceful deportation. Why were they deported? Israel was not cooperating with Babylon, and Babylon was their savior. It was their protector. In all the world, when they, you had an empire, all the civilized world would pay tribute to that nation, and Israel was supposed to be paying tribute and bowing to the king of Babylon, yet they're going over here to Egypt and trying to form an alliance with Egypt, and they're not supposed to do that. And Jeremiah said, do not go to Egypt. Go to Babylon in this 70 times 7. The reason God has them carried to Babylon is because they had a sabbatical year every seven years, and they never kept their sabbatical years. I keep repeating, that's the same thing as crop rotation. 
We rotate crops in the Midwest. We're supposed to. Otherwise, you'll burn up the soil and suck all the nutrients out. If you, you can't plant every year, the only way you could plant every year, and I'm not a farmer, but uh, from what I understand, the only way you could plant is if you have a farm agent come out and tell you what kind of nutrients or what kind of fertilizers to put in the soil to continue to grow. And that's not the most healthy way to do things. You have to plant certain years and leave, let the land lie fallow in other years. Now, a good farmer could tell you how that works. But in, in Israel, they had sabbatical years. You find that in Leviticus, the 25th chapter. And we find all through the Old Testament, Israel kept violating those sabbatical years. So God says, I'm going to carry you away to Babylon until the land enjoys their Sabbaths. Then I'll call you back by the four decrees of these kings, these Babylonian, not not Babylonian, excuse me, Persian, I can't spell it too fast, Persian Mede kings. Not going to go into that. That's a dual empire. That's the, that is the, uh, the goat there in D Daniel 8 uh, with the two-horned goat. You got a one-horned goat. You got, you got a two-horned goat. You got, Bab you got Persia represented as a two-horned goat, and you got Persia represented as a bear. As a bear because they had the largest armies and the bear is the largest carnivore. As a two-horned goat because they had two systems in their government, the Medes and the Persians. That's another story. Now, God says, I'll carry you away, and Daniel is over here in Babylon. And he is crying out to God, Lord, how long are we going to be in captivity? And this is what the Lord says. In Daniel, the ninth chapter, let's read here, Daniel 9, and he's talking about the 70 times 7. It's 70 times 7 because, because they, for 490 years, they never kept those sabbatical years. God says, I'm going to take you out of Israel, put you in the Bible for 70 years, one right after the other, till the land has enjoyed its Sabbaths. It's talking about till the land is able to restore the nutrients to the ground. Then I'm going to have these decrees given for you to come back. If you're not obedient to these decrees, Cyrus decree, to go back and rebuild the temple in Ezra, the first chapter, also in Second Chronicles, Chronicles, the 36th chapter, the last few verses, and that's the first decree. That was in 538, 538 B.C. And then the second decree, the second decree will be uh, by Darius. And Darius will give a decree to reaffirm this first decree that Cyrus made. It's very detailed. And Darius gives that his decree in Ezra, the sixth chapter. And that is in 520 B.C. Now, remember they're carried away captive in 586 B.C. And they're going to be there 70 years. Well, the, the, te the temple is finished in 516 B.C. That's exactly 70 years after they're carried away. And then in Ezra, the sixth chapter, that's where Darius gives this decree uh, to to uh, go back and finish the temple. And then you have in, you have Artaxerxes. He gives the decree in Ezra, the seventh chapter, to take supplies, to take some uh, priests back, and all the needs of the temple after they get it finished. And he gives that decree in 457 B.C., and uh, that is by art. And then, let me erase this down here. And then one last decree. This is the beginning of the 70 weeks of Daniel. 70 weeks are determined so is for Israel's complete repentance, but that takes you to the end of time. The reason this 70-week series is so important is because we're going to look at the 70th week of Daniel, 70 weeks. 69 of these weeks are already completed. Let me move this over here. 69 of the weeks are done, and we know that's true 
because the Bible says from the going forth in this ninth chapter of Daniel, look at it right here in Daniel 9. Daniel 9. Well, let me read. Daniel is crying to the Lord how long we're going to be in this captivity. He's over there in Babylon. He is a servant in the court of these kings. All these kings seem to like Daniel a lot, particularly Nebuchadnezzar, uh, not Nebuchadnezzar, excuse me, uh, Cyrus, Darius, and uh, they particularly like Daniel. And the angel of the Lord, Gabriel, comes to Daniel about the time of the evening oblation. Every day they offered a lamb in the evening about sundown with a bread offering. And at the time of that sundown bread offering, the angel Gabriel comes and talks to Daniel and says, Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people, the Jews, Israel, and upon thy holy city, Jerusalem, to do six things, to finish the transgression of all their going after these idol gods, this, this Shemash and Molech, which eventually was brought into the church in 325 A.D., and renamed the Christ Mass. And that's another entire story, or Christmas. And then he says, to make an end of sins of Israel, which is going to be the church. There's a transition in this when Christ is nailed to the cross in Colossians 2.14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances. All the rituals are blotted out. Notice how all these lessons crisscross. Have you noticed that? They crisscross one another. I won't be off the subject tonight. You stay on the subject at all times. If you're preaching predestination, whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. Who did he foreknow? His Israel. And his Israel has always been spiritual. Not just the church spiritual Israel, but Old Testament Israel. The only people that were going to heaven out of Old Testament Israel were the ones that were spiritual. Ones that believed God obeyed his, his word. Then he says, to make reconciliation for iniquity. Reconciliation, kafar, means atonement. Kafar. And to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up or to stop all the vision. The word kafar means to stop all the vision and prophecy. Bring it to a close. When? Right then or at the end of time? You're going to have to wait. <laughs> I can't tell you right now. I'm going to talk about that. <laughs> and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. I keep saying, anoint the most holy is put last in this thing because the most holy was the holy of holies. That was called the house of God because God dwelt between the cherubim. Dwelt means to build a house or to marry. God was married to Israel and we are God's house. And the last one, the high priest would come in there uh, once a year on Nisan, uh, excuse me, on Tishri, the tenth of Tishri, to sprinkle the Ark of the Covenant. Our hearts are sprinkled now, and that would be the anointing of the Most Holy. We as the house of God, when God anoints the last one there in Revelation 10 and 7, when the seventh trumpet sounds or the last trumpet sounds, the mystery of God, the church, will be complete. That'll be the last one coming into the... It's as though our hearts are all one conglomerate heart. And he's sprinkling the hearts of all the elect of all time. So when the last one comes into the fold, that'll be the end of it. And that'll be at the end of the 70 weeks. That'll be the 70th week. This will answer your question right here. When you read verse 24, again, when you do these six things, that'll be the end of time because that'll be the complete anointing of all of God's elect of all time. The last one coming into the fold. The last one that's a part of the house of God. The last heart that is anointed. That'll be the complete anointing. It's as though God is, God doesn't live in time. He lives in eternity. Everything is the forever now. And it's as though he looks at it from the beginning of time to the end of time, and he sweeps his hand with the blood of Christ, anointing all the holy until the last one comes in. It's like one sweep of God's hand. You understand what I'm saying? And all of the elect of all time, he goes, it's done. And that'll be the anointing the most holy. Now, he tells us that no one 
in verse 25, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem, which is this last commandment in Nehemiah, the second chapter, Artaxerxes, Art gives the decree for Nehemiah to go back and rebuild the city. That's the decree that's in 444 B.C., some say 445, until, until Luke 19, when Jesus comes in to the city of Jerusalem, looks out over the city and says, Jerusalem, how often would I gather you as a mother hen doth gather her chicks, but you would not. He puts this this way, and that was in Matthew, the, that was in Matthew, the 12th chapter, starting in verse 1, but over there in Luke 19, he says, If thou hast known even thou in this thy day the things that belong to thy peace. But now, Israel, you're blinded, and I'm going to take my message. Four days, uh, four days later, he'll be crucified as the Passover lamb. And 50 days after that will be Pentecost, and that's where he'll birth the New Testament spiritual Israel church. And that'll be for the last days, or for 2,000 years. In that proximate time period, I believe we're coming down close to the end of all things. Now, Let's continue reading here. From the going forth the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem and to Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks, three score and two weeks. A score is 20. Three, uh, three score is 60 plus two is 62 plus seven is 69 of those 70 weeks will be fulfilled when Jesus comes in Jerusalem. But that's when the G literal Jews' eyes will be blind and God's going to pour out of his spirit on all flesh, all men, as opposed to one flesh in the Old Testament. That's like a review of everything I've been teaching on this. This is nothing but a story of God's people, His Israel, His covenant. His covenant which He started in Genesis 1.1. Create. Create as a righteous word without form as an unrighteous word. Now, what I want to talk to you about is about that 70th week. Let's look here. He says, after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. That'll be at the end of the 69 weeks or end of the 483 years. 69 times 7 is 483 years. And that will end at Messiah the Prince. And then the times of the Gentiles will come in. At the end of time will be the 70th week. And it'll be divided into two parts. It'll be divided. This will be the, let me, let me put it over here. At the end of time, the 70th week will be divided like so. Three and a half years. Or that's called a time, times, and half a times. It is understood by all the scholars this means times is two years, a time is a year, half the time is half a year, so that's three and a half years, or 1,260 days, or 42 months. 42 months is one half of seven years, or three and a half years. 1,260 days on a 360-day Jewish calendar is 1,260 days is three and a half years. I'm going to talk to you about this word, 1,203 score days. I'm going to talk to you about that in a little bit because we don't believe in a millennium here, but we do believe, well, I better not say that right now. I need to explain it when I say it. Now, let's uh, read that 27th verse. This is about the 70th week. What happens in this 70th week is the fulfillment. Just put in your Bible. Verse 27 is fulfillment of verse 24. It'll be at the end of the 70th week. Now, let's read verse 27. And the people of the prince, well, in verse 26, the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Now, that's talking about the people that destroys the city and the sanctuary 
will be in 70 A.D. when Titus, the Roman general, comes in and levels Jerusalem, and they have their last, they have Custer's last stand at Masada. That's a mountain right over close to the Dead Sea. It's a big flat mountain, and Israel made a last stand, and they were slaughtered there. And the end thereof shall be with a flood. We said last week a flood was a military flood there in the 28th chapter of Isaiah where the Assyrians are called a flood uh, coming upon Israel to destroy them. And unto the end of the war, the war between God and Israel, desolations are determined. Israel will be desolate, the city will be desolate until they come back at the end of 2,600 years and they rescue the city of Jerusalem from the Arabs or from the Jordanians there in the Six-Day War, June 5th through June 10th, 1967. He shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. I said it last week. I could The covenant. The is a definite article. How can the man of sin confirm the covenant of God? That covenant started in Genesis 1.1. Does the man of sin with Satan have anything to do to confirming a peaceful covenant with Israel? Not a thing. How will he confirm the covenant? He's going to cause to come to pass what's in verse 24. An end of sins, reconciliation for iniquity, finishing the transgression, that Israel went against God and went after other gods. How is he going to do that? It's going to take the full 70 weeks, let me put it this way, full 70 weeks to bring about the six points of Daniel 9, 27, right? Yeah. Uh, 9, 24, excuse me. It'll take the full 70 weeks. It won't happen in less than that. So when God has got 69 of the weeks, from Nehemiah 2, ending when Jesus comes in Jerusalem, Luke 19, and then you got the Gentiles' eyes open, the Gentile church, New Testament Israel, spiritual Israel, until the end of time, and then you got the week that you've got, you got the 69 weeks, or 483 years, fulfilled from Nehemiah 2 to Luke 19, then the, gen, the Gentile church, or the all flesh, or all men, all men, and then at the end of this, the church becomes apostate. And that's where we are now. That's why we can look at the world around us, and all we got is a bunch of soft, easy, fluffy, cotton candy gospel. The apostasy is here. I tried to watch Charles Stanley before I come to church this morning. It was like watching a blubbering idiot. It's just terrible. He's just talking and talking and this over there and, and this guy and God loves us all and, and love is a wonderful thing and we have love in our hearts. We love each other and you have to have a real good godly love. And a godly love is a wonderful kind of God love and you're just going, what? Just nothing. That's apostasy. Apostasy comes from apostasis. It is the word apostasis, falling away. The Lord, they of the Lord will not come except to come an apo, a removal of stasis, standing upright. From stasis we get staros, the word cross. There's a removal of the daily cross. Nobody talks about it anymore. You don't get a daily cross by saying, Jesus loves you, God loves you. Don't get one for that. You get one for saying, God does not love everybody. He loved his wife, the church, and died for her and nobody else. And only few people are going to heaven because God only loves few. Fear not little flock. Straight is the gate and narrow is the way it leads to life, and few will find it. You tell people that, tell them Christmas is pagan, Easter is pagan, and they'll crucify you. That's why these preachers, they want to keep all that big money coming in, keep all them big ties coming in for those rich wolves that come to the church. I wouldn't compromise the truth that I preach somebody came to the church and said, I'm going to give you a million dollars a week, I said, take your money and leave. I didn't start this ministry as a class in my house to get big money. You can do better than what we're doing if you go out there and compromise and apostatize. They removed the daily cross. They not only removed the daily cross, 
They remove the cross of Christ. They'll say, we need to preach the cross of Christ. What is the cross of Christ? He died on a cross, a wooden cross, for his wife only and nobody else. The cross of Christ is about God's atonement being limited to his wife, isn't it? You tell people that and they'll crucify you on a daily cross. So we're in the apostasy. This is what's going to happen. We've got all kinds of problems in the world. We got, have you noticed Greece is on, the, is on the point of collapsing in Greece, and they've got soldiers in the streets, and Italy is at the same point. You, got, you have economic devastation throughout the world. There's going to have to be somebody step forward. He's going to be called the man of sin, according to the Bible, or the son of perdition. And he will be the man that steps forward and says, I've got a wonderful idea how to cure the world's ills. We'll get the United Nations together, the United States and Russia and China, and we'll come together and we'll hold hands and let everybody have their religion and get along. And you people that want to start trouble, we're going to start the fairness doctrine in your country. And we're going to make an amendment to the Constitution because we're going to need to do that in order for there to be freedom of speech. Everybody deserves to have their own freedom. And if you speak out against them, Jim Brown, we'll put you in jail. It's going to have to look good from a world viewpoint. Now, look here in verse 27. It says in the Septuagint, it doesn't say he shall confirm the covenant. It says the weak shall confirm the covenant. And the week, the last week of time, the 70th week, will confirm these six points of verse 24. It'll bring God's Israel to repentance. Not the literal Israel over there, not the so-called church here, but it'll be all those predestinated elect family that believe in godly, holy, righteous living. In obedience to his word, God's going to bring his people to obedience. Because that's what faith is. That's what belief is. Believe is the verb. Faith is the noun. Believing is doing what faith believes. Now, the weak shall confirm this covenant. In the midst of the weak, this man of sin will cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. The sacrifice was daily at this altar, at the brazen altar, every morning at sunup, sunup, or somewhere around six in the morning, and every evening about sunset, sunset, somewhere around six o'clock, they had a lamb and had an oblation, which was the bread offering. The bread is the word of God and the lamb is Christ. And that is in us. And they will cease to allow us to eat of Christ and go and eat of the bread and go out and take our cross and die daily. That's going to be the cessation there. It's not going to be uh, something over here in literal Israel. If anybody offers lambs over there, that will be an abomination of a stink to God. So he'll cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease and, and shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease for the overspreading kanah, for the extremity of the abominations, he shall make Jerusalem desolate. Even until the consummation and adult, God has consumed all of his judgments that he has brought upon his church or Israel, and that determined, what is it that's been determined? Seventy-sevens to bring about the six points of Daniel 9.24, and shall, it shall be poured upon the desolate upon Jerusalem. Now, we're going to talk about the split in that 70th week. All right, let me erase this. This is what's going to point us towards the end of time. The causing of the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. That's called the abomination of desolation. That happened in Daniel the 11th chapter, literally, literally, you're going to have this 70th week. You're going to have the 70th week. It's going to be split in two, three and a half years. A time, times, and half a times. 
a time time have 1260 days days or 42 months that's all three and a half years this 1260 days uh, that kind of throws a hitch in things unless you know the Jews had 360 days in their yearly calendar 42 months is exactly three and a half years this is three and a half years on Jewish calendar this is three and a half years three and a half and that's also called three and one half days these are weeks of years that's called three and a half days in Revelation the 11th chapter It's talking about the two witnesses will lie in the streets of the city called Sodom and Egypt for three and a half days that's talking about the church will be attacked and people will die the two and a half wit the two witnesses is the church it is the priest and the king priest and king priest and king quoted from Zechariah the fourth chapter where that these two anointed ones the two anointed ones in the Old Testament are the two that stand beside the Lord of the whole earth and the two that represented God in the earth was a priest and the king and God had made us priests and kings priests offer acceptable sacrifice kings pronounce righteous judgment that's what's going to that is what will cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease when we preach to people and we give our bodies a living sacrifice and we tell them the truth. Now, I, I'm not going to go into the two witnesses don't have time, but that is the priest and the king. That's the church. The church is going to be attacked and they're going to die in the streets of the world for three and a half years. And at the end of the three and a half years, they're going to be taken up to meet the Lord in the air. That's what the Bible says there in Revelation 11. Now, I want us to go over there to the New Testament and look at that 70th week. Is the first three and a half weeks? Uh, the first three and a half is the peace. Yeah. Let's look at it. I need to take you over to, uh, goodness, I got so many places to go. Let's go to, first of all, let's go to Daniel 7. Back up to Daniel 7. Now, this Daniel 7 is talking about the beast. It's talking about the lion, bear, leopard, and the beast with iron teeth. We've gone through this. This is Daniel 7. It's the Babylonian lion. And we can go through and prove that, and I'll come back to that. It's the, it's the Persian bear. The bears are the largest carnivores. The Persian has the largest armies. Babylonian lion, the lion is the most regal of the animals in the jungle. Babylon was the most regal of empires. And the Persian, the Grecian leopard, the killing machine, that was Alexander the Great, super soldier. The beast with iron teeth is Rome, and this is the beast that devours these other three and swallows them up. Now let's go to Daniel. Daniel 7 and verse, gosh, I'd like to read this whole chapter, but don't have time. We see the little horn. Let me read some of this. You see these beasts. Look at verse 17. These great beasts, which are four, are four kings, which shall arise out of the earth. And they did arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom of God, Israel, the church, forever, even forever and ever. Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast, the Rome. Of course, Rome extends itself into Roman Catholicism. Roman Catholicism comes out of the Roman Empire, the pagan Roman Empire, and I don't have time to go through that other than just say when the old fire worship of the Roman Empire was outlawed, the title of the high priest of the fire worship of the Roman Empire was Pontifex Maximus. Maximum high priest. What is the, what is the high priest of Roman Catholicism? Pontifex Maximus, the Pope. Same title. This old Roman Empire fire worship was reinstituted in Roman Catholicism. All of those icons' names were changed. Peter... Peter took on, Jupiter's name was changed to Peter. The female mediatrix, which was 
was uh, Mileta in the Roman Empire, or Venus, or Aphrodite, I'll just put Aph on there, or the rest of these, these, these goddesses were given the name Mary, and it became uh, in the Roman Empire. So let's look at this. I don't have, gosh, you know how many things are going through my head right now? I got to slow down. Because if you can understand this, I'm nearly talking myself into a, a dizziness. Now, let's go back to where I was. The fourth beast, which exceedingly dreadful, whose teeth were of iron. We saw his iron teeth back up there in verse 7. Iron was considered a curse in the ancient world. Rome was always identified as being having iron teeth. When we see in the first part of this book in Daniel, uh, when Daniel, excuse me, yeah, when Daniel, I keep saying the wrong name, when Nebuchadnezzar has his dream in the second chapter and he sees the image, sees this image, he sees the head of gold, he sees the, the, the breast of silver and the torso of brass and the legs of iron and clay, the head, he tells, Daniel tells king, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, thou art the head of gold. Persia, which overthrows Babylon, the head. Persia is the, is the breast of silver. If you notice, as you go down, the metals become less precious, because, but they become stronger. Each moving down that, that uh, image, you get stronger and stronger metals and they didn't have any alloys back then, and iron was the strongest of all metals back then. So you got the head of gold, Babylon. Same thing as the four beasts. Babylon is overthrown by Persia, the silver chest. Babylon, uh, the, the breast is overthrown by the torso of brass. That would be uh, Greece, and that was overthrown by the legs of iron. And they were legs of iron and clay. But the iron and clay, the Scripture says, are not mixed. You cannot make an alloy of iron and clay. Clay is a picture of Israel or the church, and they had these treading troughs, and the Bible says that Israel had to be treaded underfoot, and they would tread the clay in these treading troughs so they could get all of the, all the bubbles out and the impurities out. The clay is not mixed with iron. The iron legs was that of the, of the get in a minute, of the Roman Empire treading down the church. But that happens all the way to the end because Roman Catholicism takes on the beast system. And the world has adopted Roman Catholicism because Catholicism was founded on the edict of toleration or we call that political correctness. Let's all get along and hold hands. We're back to that with this political correctness thing in the world. So we're headed towards, I believe, towards the end of all things. There's nothing more important than buying to the will of God right now because I believe we're headed to some of the worst times that we have ever seen in the history of the world. Such times as was not from the beginning, no, nor ever shall be. Now, look over here in, where was I? Daniel 9, 27. Uh, Daniel 9, back up here to verse, verse uh, where was I? Verse 19. Seven. I would know the truth of the fourth beast, which would be Rome, which was diverse from the others, exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were of iron, his nails of brass. By the way, the breastplate, notice three times you got this iron, the iron legs of the image, the, the iron teeth here, and remember the scorpions of, Revelation 9, they had breastplates of iron. And I did a study on scorpions. Scorpions are false teachers. And false teachers come out of Babylon, which Roman Catholicism comes out of that. And it's all, let us make us a name, it's pride or it's self. So when you've got, you've got the breastplates of iron of the scorpions or the false teachers and when you look at an arachnid book, a book on arachnids, which a scorpion is an arachnid, 
they'll tell you that the breastplate of scorpions tell you what family they belong to. So it belongs to the Roman family or the Babylonian family. When you say Rome, you're talking about Greece. You're talking about the beast with seven heads. A head was the capital city. Go back to Greece. Rome, Greece, Persia, Babylon. If you're talking about Rome or the Roman Catholic Church, you're still going back to Babylon. Let us make us a name. Let us make us say Shem. Let us make up our own authority, right? So is Catholicism, let us make us a name. Is the Baptists, let us make us a name. Is the Pentecostals, let us make up our own authority. Sure it is. And it's all about, let's hold hands and get along. Don't preach against your neighbor. We're Baptists, but... We don't believe in talking about the Catholics. We know they believe they have to eat Jesus to go to heaven. We believe you've got to accept Christ and pray the sinner's prayer to go to heaven. But we're all going to hold hands and get along. In fact, if they have, a, if they have an abortion clinic, we're going to sit down together and hold hands together. We're not supposed to be doing that, are we? Now, let's continue to read. In verse 20, And the ten horns that were on in his head... I've gone through a whole series on the ten horns. If I say something, people go, oh, it don't make any sense. I believe the ten horns is northern Israel. Because northern Israel brought the fire worship into Israel, and there were ten northern tribes, and each one was an army in itself, and an army was a power. And when Israel brought it in, brought in, the beast could only overthrow Israel because Israel went after Baal in the grove. As long as you obedient to me, God says, you'll go against your enemy one way, and it does not know, no matter how many there are, and they'll flee seven ways. There can be an entire empire. There's no way that Assyria could have carried northern Israel captive, or Babylon could have carried southern Judah captive, if northern Israel and southern Judah had been obedient, they gave their power to the beast. Their power was to overcome everybody in the world, but you submit that to the beast when you're disobedient to me. And Revelation, the 17th chapter, says that, says that the beast got its power from the ten horns. That's a very abstract thing, isn't it? And I'll go back into that when we get back into Revelation. Now, this y'all realize I'm skipping a stone over just over the edge of the top of some of this. I want to stop and talk about this for two hours, but I don't have time. Now, and the ten horns that were in, in his head and the others which came up before whom three fell, the first three, Babylon, Persia, Greece, the lion, the bear, and the leopard fell at the hands of Rome, even that horn had eyes and a mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. The fellows would be Babylon, Persia, Greece. And I beheld, and the same horn made war with the saints. This is the head of the world system. The head of the Roman Empire, the Caesars, made war with the saints, didn't they? The Roman Catholic Church made war with the saints with the church, didn't they? Look over here in Revelation 13. This is prophecy. Look at Revelation 13. Revelation 13 is talking about the same beast. It's the same context. Revelation 13. And we see here. I've put a hundred, I don't know how many hours, thousands of hours in studying this and analytically dissecting and bisecting this. I can't tell you everything I'm even thinking as I go through it. Please forgive me. We see the beast with seven heads and ten horns in verse 13. And the beast I saw was like a leopard. Hey, I think that's the same beast in Daniel 7. He sees a four great beasts come up out of the sea, one like a lion, one like a bear, another like a leopard had four heads. That was the four generals of Alexander the Great's army, Castor and Lysacomus, Ptolemy and, and uh, Seleucus. 
Then he says uh, over here in the 13th chapter, And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and its feet were as the feet of a bear. It's not his. It's the word ought to. It's neuter gender. So it's an it. It's the same it as, as in Daniel 13. Uh, Daniel 7. Revelation 13. And it had the feet of a bear, and its mouth as the mouth of a lion. There you are, the lion, the bear, and the leopard. And the dragon, dracon. Dracon means to talk smooth. Hmm. Same thing as serpent in the garden. Nakosh means one who enchants. Gave him its power, its seed, and its great authority. And I saw one of its heads as it wounded to death. A head was a capital city. A mountain was a capital city. And one of the capital cities was wounded to death. That's when the Roman Empire was outlawed in Rome. And then it was, then it was resurrected in the form of Roman Catholicism. Don't have time to go into the details on that. And its deadly wound was healed whenever it rose. It's not John Kennedy getting shot by Lee Harvey Oswald in 1964. I was 25 years old. In 1963, I was 24 years old. I'll get it right in a minute. 1962. <laughs> I was 23 years old when John Kennedy got shot by Lee Harvey Oswald and all the independent Baptist preachers in Texas saying, he's out of Christ, he's going to raise from the dead. Yeah. Dummies. The deadly wound is healed. It's not a Roman Catholic getting shot in the head. It's one of the capital cities being stopped from executing its laws. That was the Roman... <coughs> empire under the rule of Rome. His deadly wound was healed and all the world wandered after the beast, which is an it. But it has a leader called the man of sin. The same thing as the little horn in Daniel 7. And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with this world-ruling new world order. Do you know that shocked me when George Bush Sr. said that? I went, whoa. And he started talking about a new world order. He don't know all the Baptist preachers in America been preaching against the new world order for a hundred years. And there was given unto it, not him, a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto it to continue forty and two months. Half of seven years, right? That's the three and a half years at the end of time. And it opened its mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle. The word tabernacle, skews, S-K-E-U-S. From, from, it is a derivative of S-K-E-N-E, skene, it means a wife being useful to her husband. He's making war with the church, and we're useful to our husband, Christ. Now, this is war against the saints. It was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And this is the man of sin or the son of perdition, as he's called in Second Thessalonians, the second chapter, and in John, the 17th chapter. And what's amazing is Judas was given the same name, son of perdition, in the 17th chapter of John, same name as the man of sin was given at the end of time in Second Thessalonians, the second chapter. People say, was Judas saved? Didn't he repent? No. He knew he had betrayed innocent blood, but he didn't repent. Because the Bible says it's better for that man to have never been born. God wouldn't give, the, give a title to a man that he's one of his elect, son of perdition. And he wouldn't say a, one of the elect, it's better that he'd never been born if he betrayed Christ. Now, so here's, two and a, here's three and a half years right here. Making war against the saints. And I beheld in the same, war, same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. Now go back to Daniel 7. We're talking about war being made with the saints at the last half of the 70 weeks of Daniel 70 weeks. Jim, I don't understand this. You're not going to understand quickly what I've been studying for 60 years. 
watch this DVD over and over. Not just this DVD, but all these previous Sundays. And if you watch them, I'm going to go to all the details that I can and help you. I have, I've said some things here today. People go, what are you talking about? The beast says him. The word is A-U-T-O. A-U-T-O-U, excuse me. There in Revelation 13, and it's the lion, the bear, and the leopard. And you got a lion, bear, and leopard over here, over here in Daniel 7. Well, God doesn't change from a, a world uh, empire to a man over here. A-U-T-O-U has to either, it's translated him and his here in Revelation 13. And all two is a form of A-U-T-O, and that would be masculine gender, but A-U-T-O-U, I've said in the Greek, word endings are changed depending on the character of the word. A-U-T is the stem of the word. So you're going to get the either gender or person or something along that line by the word ending. O-U has to be neuter gender or masculine depending on the antecedent, A-N-T-E-C-E-D-E-N-T. -E 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 the antecedent is the noun or the pronoun that a pronoun refers back to. And it has to carry the same gender as the antecedent. When you see his there in Revelation 13, and you look back at the antecedent, the beast, The beast is Totherion, and that spelling is a neuter gender. And why those Catholic Baptist translators put him is beyond me. It's an it. It's a world system. It's neuter gender. The beast is neuter. You can't say Jim went to the store. She bought a loaf of bread. Well, goodness, you start calling me she, I'm going to be really wondering about you. Or it bought a loaf of bread. This is going to have to match Jim. He, the same way with the beast. And people said, you think you're smarter than those translators on this I am? And on other places where they compromise, and I believe the Catholics did this. Of course, I don't believe the Calvinists that were in there were exactly totally upright because I'd have stood there and said, no. I walk out first. But how are you going to fight City Hall? <laughs> At that time, the translating room was City Hall. No, City Hall was King James. He didn't know what he was. His mother was Mary Queen of Scots. She was also heir to the throne of France and heir to the throne of England. She was heir to three thrones, France by marriage, uh, Scotland, because she was raised there, but Scotland was the home of John Knox, the great reformer, believed in predestination, the sovereignty of God, and she's down there in the Church of England, which came out of Catholicism. She didn't know what she was. And she was raised by Jesuits, and she leaned towards John Knox's beliefs, but didn't know if she wanted to leave Catholicism. And so when she has, when her son comes up, he's raised by a mother that's confused out of her mind, and uh, if she'd have got the throne of England and Scotland and France, she'd have been the most powerful monarch that ever lived. But she didn't. Now, where was I? Oh, back to Daniel. I'm sorry that God is so complex, but I've, I have gone over and over and over this. Get a hold of it a little at a time. Don't expect to get it all at once. Some things I'm just throwing comments out here real fast because I don't have time to spend on it, but I'll spend a lot of time through this series on prophecy. Now, Daniel 7. Back to Daniel 7. All right. I'm talking about war on the saints for the last three and a half years. When he caught, if if the man of sin causes the sacrifice and the oblation of the church to cease throughout the world, it's going to take a man that's in charge to do that, isn't it? He's going to have to be the boss of the world at that time. 
is he going to do that by being tyrannical? No, he's going to be a real nice guy saying, look, Mr. Brown, he's going to send his representatives in. Look, we're all trying to get along. We're trying to bring a world peace about. Do you know that George Bush Sr., through this new world order he wanted to raise up, said we could have world peace? He didn't have any sense. But Jim, George Jr. didn't have any sense. Well, there's not a president ever been in there had any sense. You think they did? You actually think they're there to help the American public instead of help their American pocket? They're there for money and power. Now back to Daniel. How much time do I have, Mike? 28. Boy, I'm not even hardly starting on this. I was going to get to the thousand years. I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this. Well, I won't this morning. Now go back to Daniel 7. Verse 21, But held in the same horn made war with the saints. That's the man of sin pointing toward the future. I don't need, I started to say something. I don't know if I, nah. <laughs> When you're in Daniel 11, this is the first abomination Abomination of desolation is, that is, the sacrifice and the oblation ceasing. Oblation ceasing. And in Matthew 24, the apostles asked Jesus, Lord, when are these things going to be and what's going to be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? When is it that one stone's not going to be left upon another Jerusalem? And when is the end of the world? I'm not going, I could go into Ionos, which is the word end of the world, and I don't have time to do that. For you preterists out there that think I can't answer that, yeah, I can. Now, Daniel 11, we find the first abomination of desolation as Matthew 24, as spoken by Daniel the prophet. When they say, what's going to be the sign of thy coming? Well, he goes through, he goes through when you, uh, many will come saying, I'm Christ, wars and rumors of war, nation rise against nation, the love of many waxing cold. And then he said, you'll see the abomination of desolation. That's the sacrifice and the oblation ceasing as spoken by Daniel the prophet in Daniel 11 and also there in Daniel 9.27. That's the abomination of desolation, the sacrifice ceasing, and the literal shadow was here in Daniel 11. In Daniel 11, it's the whole chapter, that's where, you remember I told you about the four generals of Alex the Great, you had Cassander, Lysacomus, you had Seleucus, and you had Ptolemy. These are Alexander's four generals that inherited his empire, and the beasts with iron teeth subdued these, these, and that was Rome subjugating these four generals. But Alex, Alex's empire, Alex the Great, was divided up by the, these generals. Cassander and Lysacomus was given all this area over in here, and the man who got the lion's share of the empire was Seleucus. Seleucus got Syria and all in here, and he was always attacking these different generals were attacking. The Ptolemies got Egypt down here, this area. They're called the Ptolemies. You had Ptolemy Philopater, Philopater, Pater being father, Philos meaning a fondness or affection. They named their children after characters, characterizations or act, after adverbial words or adjective words in the Greek language. So you'd have, uh, uh, you had Seleucus was the head of the Syrian Empire and he wanted to come down and attack Egypt. 
Well, he came down to attack Egypt. Of course, notice the road down there goes through Israel. That's the only way to get down to Egypt. Because that's green there. That's part of the Fertile Crescent. So he comes down to Egypt first, and it says there in Daniel 7, they sit at one table together, they promise all these things to each other, and they're lying through their teeth. They're flattering one another. They sit down at this table full of flatteries. Well, Seleucus goes back and gathers troops together to come down here to attack uh, Egypt, the Ptolemies. When he does that, an emissary from Rome sends a message to him. It says, I want you to meet me on the Isle of Chittim. But it's actually Cyprus. And there it is right there. And this, Rome is ruling the world. Remember we said that they would allow you to rule your own kingdom as long as you behave yourself. Rome would let the solutions rule. You'd have one solution after another. You'd have Antiochus the first, Antiochus the great, Antiochus the god. That's why you had so many Antiochs. You had one up here in Galatia, you had one down here in Syria. You had Antiochs a little bit everywhere. Well, Seleucus coming down here with his armies. This is the first. When you find the, the abomination of desolation as spoken of by Daniel the prophet, it's talking about Seleucus coming down here to attack Egypt. Rome, the bosses of the world, the kings of all the kings of the earth, sends a message, and one of the generals comes down here to meet with, with uh, Antiochus Epiphanes. Antiochus Epiphanes meets with this general on Cyprus. And the general steps out there. He draws a circle around Antiochus. And he says, don't you step out of that circle until you promise me that you're not going to attack Ptolemies. We rule the Ptolemies. We rule you. We rule Cassander. We rule Asakamas. We rule the world. Don't move out of that circle until you promise you will not attack Egypt. And he's gritting his teeth going, ah, ah, all right. And he is so angry, he is infuriated. So he takes his armies, heads back to Jerusalem, desecrates the temple, offers a swine on the altar, raises up an Ashtaroth in Jerusalem, and that was the original abomination that was spoken of by Daniel the prophet. But there, that was a shadow of the abomination of desolation at the end of time. And that'll be the sacrifice and the oblation ceasing, not in a literal temple, in this temple, which temple ye are, it'll be a cessation of the bread and giving our bodies a living sacrifice. They'll come to us and say, look, you can study your Bible and read it, but you can't go out and preach against anybody else. You can't go out here in public. We're making all these rules. This thing in South Carolina, they're going to make rules against everything. Do you actually believe, do I believe, that taking a Confederate flag down is going to stop some wacko from going into a place and shooting people? I think they ought to take all flags down. I think they ought to take down the stars and stripes. When... Betsy Ross didn't even make that flag. Oh, that's wrong. And when, when uh, Sir Francis Scott Key wrote the Star Spangled Banner, he wrote it against us, except it wasn't a national anthem till eight years before I was born. In 1931, we didn't have a national anthem. And Francis Scott Key said this war was a lump of wickedness and he thought America ought to lose it because we were attacking British ships because they were, they were carrying supplies to their, their friends and some of our enemies. So we started attacking Great Britain and they started attacking us. And the War of 1812 was accomplished zero. So I think they ought to get rid of all. And Ben Franklin said... Somebody asked Ben Franklin, what does the American flag look like? He said, I think it's got red, white, and blue stripes. They only created it so we could go in and out foreign ports so they'd know who we were. That's all to identify us. 
It never flew on any ships in the War of 1812. It flew on one ship, the ship of John Paul Jones, nobody else's. It never flew on any, any American buildings until the Mexican-American Mexican Wars of the 1840s. And when you see all those pictures of flags, especially the spirit of 76, you remember the picture of the spirit of 76 and the guy's got the flute and the guy's playing the drums, they're marching along? Richard Shankman, historian, says it never happened. They didn't fly the flag in the Revolutionary War. He said that was an empty gesture. He said they consider you patriotic if you picked up your rifle and you went and started shooting. <laughs> Just, he said where those flags came from in those Revolutionary War pictures, you had a bunch of moralists in the 1800s and they started painting pictures of the American flag in the American Revolution. So take down the... I don't believe in racism. Everybody here knows that. But taking a the Confederate flag down is going to stop that wacko kid from... If you let him out of jail, he'll go shoot some more people. Won't he? How empty have we, we have gotten. You know why he shot all those people? I'm going to tell you why. The preachers in America, that's why. The problem all rests with the preachers. When you go to the Old Testament, God never attacked the pagans. He attacked the pastors of the churches of Israel. He said that, I'm against the pastors. I'll require their flock at your hand. That boy was a nut. Can we get rid of nuts by pulling down flags and you mean you can stop some redneck in Georgia who drives a pickup truck and goes to the wrestling matches every Saturday night and I tell you one thing, you ain't gonna take my flag away from me. I got my you'll have to pry my gun off my dead fingers. <laughs> You're really gonna change a redneck into a classy American individual or a good Christian with flags? You'll get one off the I don't care if they put it up, hang it upside down, put it under their car. Flags ain't got nothing to do with the problem in America. It's the preachers, isn't it? And those people in Congress, they're passing laws and they're going to do this and that. We're going to, you know what they're saying? We're going to legislate sin out of people's hearts. Yeah, sure you are. How disgusting. Now... Where was I? All right. Back to Daniel 7. I'm not hardly going to get started on this. I'm going to have to resume this next week. Where was I? Daniel 7, verse 20, 21. I beheld in the same horde made war with the saints and prevailed against them until the Ancient of Days came. That's a title for God, an ancient title for the Lord. And judgment was given to the saints of the Most High, and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom of God, which is Israel the church. And thus he saith, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth, that's Rome. And it will, in, it will continue through the Roman Catholicism, which shall be diverse from all the kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth. How about all the earth was drunken with the wine of the fornication of the, of the harlot that sits upon the beast. And the harlot was the city of Babylon founded upon self. Let us make us a name. Same thing here. Yeah, that's the same thing as all the earth was made drunk. And shall tread it down and break it in pieces. And the ten horns out of the kingdom... Or the ten kings that shall arise, and another shall rise after them, and he shall be diverse from the first, and shall subdue three kings. That's the first three. He shall speak great words against the Most High. This is the man of sin. And shall wear out the saints. Bela, B-L-A, afflict. This is a man of sin. Declaring war against the saints for three and a half years, a time, time, and half a times. 
Let's read this verse 25. He shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and God's laws. Well, I think that uh, gay marriage is okay. I don't think God will mind as long as you love each other. Homosexuality is all right. I don't have an axe to grind with homosexuals. It's not, it's not the worst sin. It's a presumptuous sin, a zood sin. David said, deliver me from presumptuous sin. He was talking about adultery and murder that he had committed. With Bathsheba and having her husband murdered, Uriah the Hittite. I had a lesbian come to church one time, and she said, is lesbianism a sin? I said, it is, but it's not worse than other planned sin, than adultery, than murder than robbing banks. You have to plan to rob a bank, don't you? When David said, deliver me from planned sin, it's like Spurgeon's sin. Presumptuous sin is standing right under the light and sinning right against it. God, you deliver us because we cannot. They'll change times and laws and they shall be given into the, His hand until a time and times and dividing of times for three and a half years, 42 months, 1260 days. But the judgment shall sit, and they shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it unto the end. Now, do I have any time, Mike? Well, huh? Well, well, well. Let me just read a few of these verses. We'll come back and we'll talk about them next week, okay? Look over here in, look at Daniel 12 and 7. I'll explain these as I go through them. I've spent, only God knows how much time I've spent studying prophecy in the Old Testament. I is no way of even guessing. I went for several decades studying Researching 30, 35, 40 hours a week. Just digging night and day. I want to know what these truths are. The world doesn't want to know the bad news that's coming. It's bad news to them. It's good news to us, isn't it? Look here in, in uh, Daniel 12, verse 7. I heard the man clothed in linen. Gosh, I want to go back to him, but I don't have time. I believe he's the same man you find in Ezekiel, the ninth chapter, with the pen in his hand, writing upon the foreheads of the people. The man, I heard the man, well, let me read verse 5. Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, there stood other two, the one on the side of the bank of the river and the other on the side of the bank of the river. One said to the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, How long shall it be to the end of these wonders? And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river. I, that's amazing, upon the waters. I wonder who that could be, walking on water. When he held his right hand and his left hand unto heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, that there shall be a time, times, and a half, which he shall accomplish to scatter the power of the holy people, and all those things shall be finished. Now, look over here in Revelation. Revelation 12. I'm not going to have time to go through all this. There's a thousand things that I wanted to say as I skimmed over the surface of this. But I wish I could just impart it to you, but I can't. Just watch these DVDs, get a hold of some of it, watch them over the years, and you'll get, begin to get a hold of a lot of it. Revelation 12, 12 and... Whew. Now, Revelation 12 is a panoramic view of all time. <clears throat> you see a woman... Uh, clothed with the sun, in verse 1, the moon under her feet, 
and upon her head a crown of twelve stars, twelve tribes, twelve apostles, twelve loaves of bread so that none will be lost in the sixth chapter of John. Twelve is the number of the total church. She being with child cried travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. This is a picture of Israel, the church. And there appeared another wonder in heaven and behold a great red dracon, same dragon that gave the beast its power, its seat, and its great authority in Revelation 13. Having seven heads and ten horns, same dragon, same beast, Revelation 13, is here in Revelation 12. Seven heads and seven crowns upon our heads, and his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven. This is the third part of the angels in heaven. And did cast them into the earth. That's what happened between Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2, when darkness is upon the face of the deep. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her son as soon as it was born. Kronos devoured its children as soon as they were born. Kronos was the horned god, and that's why Nimrod put the horns on his head. We get the picture of Satan with that, and that's where it comes from the Vikings, and it comes from the American Indian that wears the buffalo horns on his head and so forth. She brought forth a man-child who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. This is not Mary. This is Israel. And her child was caught up unto God to his throne. That's Jesus, isn't it? That's the man-child that Israel is bringing forth. The woman flees into the wilderness where she has a place prepared of God that they should feed her a thousand two hundred and three score days. That's half of seven years on a 360-day Jewish calendar. Same thing as 42 months, same thing as a time, time, and half a times. And there's a war with Michael the archangel and a third of these angels, and they're cast into the earth. We see lightning fall from heaven over there in Luke, the 18th chapter. Lightning falls from heaven. Uh, That's Luke 10, 8. Oh, 10, excuse me. Yeah, I'm thinking of the, the scribe, not the scribe. Got so many things going on in my head. The uh, publican. All right. There's war in heaven, Michael. To cast Satan to the earth. That has to be a panoramic sit picture because we see darkness is upon the face of the deep. That's the first sign of Satan in the Bible. That comes in verse 2 of Genesis 1. Then you've got the dragon was cast out in that old serpent, verse 9. The devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world, was cast into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. I'm running out of time. Let me jump, jump down to verse 14. Well, let me read 13 and 14. When the dragon saw that he was cast into the earth, he persecuted the woman. He persecuted the church, which was brought forth the man-child. And to the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness in the earth. And unto her a place the church is sustained, where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. She's protected just like Elijah was protected in the cave for three and a half years. Remember that? He was there two and a half years, but he's another year uh, in a city close to uh, the castle up in, the king's castle up in Tyre. And the serpent cast out of his mouth a water as a flood. What's coming out of the mouth of the serpent? False doctrine. A flood of doctrine. That's false. After the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood of false doctrine. And the earth helped the woman. God is going to hide us in the cleft of his rock. And the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, the church. There we are, back to the war, which kept the commandments of God and have the testimony, the martyrdom, martyria, 
of Jesus Christ. Do I have any time? Look back at, at Revelation 12. I mean, Revelation 11. Now, I got so much to say about this. I'll just read 11. Huh. There was given to me, verse 1, a reed like unto a rod. And the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God. You can go about it back to Zechariah, the second chapter. You can see an angel telling Zechariah to measure the temple of God. The whole idea of that is to see what's inside the border. The horizo of God. In, he's measuring what's in the city of God, which is us. And the altar and them that worship therein, but the court which is without, or outside the temple, leave out, that was the Gentile court, they're not measured in the temple of God. And measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. But he refers to this literal city of Jerusalem in the same chapter where our Lord was crucified as Sodom and Egypt in verse 8. The holy city is the church. We are heavenly Jerusalem, the church, aren't we? Church of the firstborn. And then he says in verse 3, I'll give power unto my two witnesses, the priest and the king, the church, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. This, have you, can you see how this is going? It's like a synthesis, isn't it? It's like, and I'd have to go into the two witnesses. It takes two witnesses to confirm anything in the Word of God over there in Numbers, the 35th chapter, and Deuteronomy, the 17th chapter, Deuteronomy, the, the 19th chapter, and then in John, the 8th chapter, Jesus tells the Pharisees, in your law, the word of two men is true. And that's these two witnesses right here, the priest and the king. He hath made us priests and kings, and these are the two anointed ones that stand beside of the whole earth. So the church witnesses against the guilty for 1,260 days, a time, time, and half a time. And I'm going to go into the word thousand next week. Thousand is not a numeral. Thousand is a noun. When you count one, two, three, four, five, up to 99, those are cardinal numbers. A cardinal number is when you count. One, two, three, four. When you get to a hundred, you get to a thousand. Those are nouns. When you get to a thousand, it depends on the context of Scripture as to whether it means one thousand, two thousand. I'm going to go into that, go into some of the men on that. Thousand here means thousand. Thousand in Revelation 20 means two thousand. I don't have time to go into that. I'm out of time. Let's pray. Father, thank you for truth and for your word. Lord, I don't know how to say all this. You've let me see it, but I pray that you'll somehow untangle my words in the minds and the hearts of the people. I can see it, Lord. I want to help them to see these things so they can see. We must be approaching the 70th week sometime here in the not too far distant future. Thank you for your truth. Open up many doors, supply all of our needs, lead us in everything every day we should do. We'll praise you for all things, lead us to your elect. God, help me. I have so much on me at all times. And help the church and may they mature. Help them to stand with me. This is a great, great honor and duty. And we'll praise you for all things in Christ's name. Amen. I hope that wasn't too much, folks. It's a lot of things. What y'all doing, guys? Papa. Mm -hmm. you Look, Papa. Huh? I can't hear you. I can't hear you, Papa. I want you to go to their house. What do you want? I want you to, I want to show you our kittens. You want what? We want to show you our kittens. We want to, you want some chickens. 
No, we, we want to show you our chicken. I mean kittens. Oh, you got some kittens? Uh-huh. Are you a pumpkin? Yeah. Are you a booger? Did somebody pick you out of their nose? No. Yeah, they no. did. No. There's two boogers over there. Somebody picked each one of them out of the side of their nose, didn't they? Can we have some gum? Well, you sure can. Wait a minute. Let me get some gum. Let me get over here. Get them some gum. All right. Did you build an ark? Did you? Well, you're Noah. Noah built an ark. Are you going to learn to build an ark when you grow up? What is an ark? Huh? What is an ark? Are you going to build an ark? Is it going to be 300 cubits long and 30 high and 50 wide? It's not. Don't you like arcs? Huh? There you go. Thank you. 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 <laughs> Goofuses. <laughs> Brother. Oh, just weary and warm. Man, you, you were losing me today. You, I, I, I try to keep up, but... I, think so. I was oh, trying wait. to I was trying to cover too much territory. Huh? Thank you. Okay. Come here. <laughs> okay, thank you. Well, it was a lot of stuff, but if you keep watching, I'll cover it again. Sometimes I lose myself. I say, where was I? Hey, John. Come up here and say hi. Hey, John. Oh, no, not there. Let me change the number for tonight. When you say these words to somebody, they'll get I don't see them. I think I can do it. I can't see them. I can't see them. I can't see them. I can't see them. But it's like anything else. If you listen to it, then you don't know. Everything starts to go. And if you start to see it, I know one day, and I told you to go to the side. That's all you can say. I'm telling you, I'm going to I know I heard you say something that said it was a But then I go to the She stopped using the I got it from Kentucky. He can stay with Oh, is that what you're saying?